Hi, I'm Rick Anthony, and welcome to the Someone You Should Know podcast, the podcast that focuses on musicians, authors, and interesting people. We like to say we're making a difference one artist at a time. So sit back, have a cold one, and get ready to meet someone you should know. Boy, do I have an interesting guest for you this time on the podcast. He's a psychotherapist and songwriter. Now, a few years ago, he came to realize that his work he witnessed in his day-to-day life was more compelling and inspirational than anything he was going to write songs about. So he decided to release a debut album. It's called Second Skin. It's a concept album about what he knew best, therapy. He's also created music videos to accompany this, and he's got over 41,000 views. Will you please welcome my guest, M. Brady. How you doing, my friend? Rick, thanks for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here. And and might I just add, from all the uh, unknown artists out there, we really are grateful for someone like you giving a voice to folks that um, you know have a hard time having their voice heard with over 22,000 singles released every day on Spotify. <laughs> Even the most talented people can kind of get lost in the wash. So thank you for what you do and the opportunities you give to to aspiring musicians and artists. Well, thank you. It's an absolute pleasure. It's just uh, what my goal is in life. This actually came from an idea many, many years ago when I was battling with my ego on the radio. And uh, I just heard like a resounding, stop helping yourself and start helping others you know, from from God or whoever it might have been that, that said it. But uh, it was uh, it was one of those things where the last 20 years of my life have been dedicated to helping others. And when, when they were on my show on the radio, they were the stars of the show. And I was just the just the guy that got to talk. Let's talk about your your humble beginnings. You started growing up in Washington, D.C., in the suburbs of that area there. How did that shape your music taste and such? Was there a, a strong uh, musical presence in that area that got you going? Was it the radio? What what got you going? Yeah, I, I, you know, most of the music that I was exposed to was in my family and whatever my parents were playing, you know, on the turntable, honestly. So, you know, Simon and Garfunkel, Bob Dylan, stuff like that. But, um, you know, for me, music... I, I realized the power of music and how inspirational it could be when I was twisting the dial as a young person and the song Stairway to Heaven came on and I was like, oh my God, what is this? And this this song that started so slow and and then built to this incredible crescendo. And uh, I thought, my God, this is really something. And ever since that moment, honestly, I've just been captivated by music, but particularly emotional music that, that really makes a statement. Very good. Now, how did receiving a guitar in high school for your graduation change your influence to your journey? Well, not as much as I wish it would. <laughs> um, I really only dabbled with the guitar uh, until really I was in my mid thirties. Uh, I was, uh, as maybe we'll talk about later, I was a professional tennis player and that, that took up a lot of time. I, I sort of dabbled, but I didn't really take it real seriously. And the other piece was, you know, uh, in my family, uh, I wasn't really the musician. My brother is a, was and is truly an incredible stellar musician. And my mom is really inspiring and an emotional um, singer in her own right. And so I, uh, I, my dad in the family was kind of the tennis player and then later the shrink. And uh, so, you know, it just because it wasn't part of kind of how I saw myself. And so it really took a while to sort of sort of join my, my real love for music and to not become a listener, but to really become an active participant. Very good. Now, you mentioned your mother and your brother's musical talents and such. Can you take us through that and how that kind of uh, helped mold you? Sure thing. Um, we are inspired by a lot of musicians, of course, but uh, for sure, the, the first influence is my mother. She's a liturgical singer, but honestly, she's a torch song singer in liturgical clothes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she could take uh, you know take the, the simplest hymn and create this haunting a melodic inspired um, version of the song, which uh, which I think just sort of made its way into my musical DNA, if you will, and and really also showed me the power of how to turn sort of a simple song structure into something really compelling and moving. So she was a huge influence, along with obviously lots of other talented singer songwriters over the years. And my brother, um, you know, I want to put credit where credit is due right off the bat here. He he provided a lot of the color on this record. And um, he, he plays a lot of instruments, so you know, he he felt fill in a lot. Super talented guys recorded a bunch of albums, and um, so I'm you know it's it's I've sort of felt like um, walking in a shadow for a lot of years. So the other reason this project was <laughs> sort of inspiring, I started to walk out of that shadow and create my own create my own voice. Very good. Now the first song we're going to feature is actually the title cut from your album. It's called Second Skin. Can you share uh, with us the backstory of uh, the song Second Skin? Sure thing. Um, I mean, there might be a couple of versions of this that might be interesting to you. you know, given the, the first single on the debut album is kind of a big decision, right? And so I spent hours ruminating, like, 
okay, should it be this song or that song? And, and I, at some point I had this fantasy, like if I was consulting with a record executive, like when I went to the record executive and I said, Hey, what do you think about this song? Second skin to be the first single. And my fantasy kind of went like this. They said, Michael, this is an interesting song. It's got some inspirational lyrics. Your voice sounds great, but it takes 25 seconds to get out of the intro to your voice. There's no chorus. There's no hook. Um, this is kind of an art song, not a single. And so, you know, <laughs> that was bouncing around in my head, but you know, ultimately this is a song about rebirth. It's about overcoming, um, difficulties. And, and it was also about this notion that, that time is short and has sort of a carpe diem, uh, seize the day kind of feel. And so, uh, I ultimately decided, you know, and this for me was a transformational experience making this record. And I decided to go, uh, to go against all the advice of my imaginary record executives and, and make this the first single. All right, here we go. Second skin. It's the title cut of the album. It's a song we're going to feature right now on the someone you should know podcast from today's guest in Brady. Music right there from M. Brady, the title cut from his album called Second Skin. By the way, the show notes, we've got a link to the video of that song. It's got over 41,000 views already. Let's let's see if we can make that another 41,000, okay? <laughs> Plus, uh, we have more music in store from M. Brady coming up in just a couple of minutes. But first, I want to say thanks so much for tuning in to the Someone You Should Know podcast. Heard on the, on the World Wide Web at someoneyoushouldknowpodcast.com. If you visit the website, you're going to be able to check out over 190 episodes, a whole catalog right there of stuff that you might have missed that you can now go ahead and listen to at your leisure, okay? Now, according to Buzzsprout, the service that shares us to all the streaming platforms, thank you so very much. We're incredibly blessed to be in over 2,300 cities and 90 countries around the world. I want to salute a couple of those. Bullhead City, Arizona, Moon Park, California, Kipling, Saskatchewan, Canada, and way down south, Perth, Western Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the Someone You Should Know podcast, heard wherever quality streaming audio is available. Thanks for listening. We're talking to uh, singer, songwriter, psychotherapist, and tennis player, M. Brady. 
Uh, I played tennis in high school. I was I was good, but I wasn't great. I was like the number three singles, number two doubles uh, player on the uh, high school team. I lettered in it in high school. And uh, and tennis is near and dear to my heart. Can you share with us some of your highlights of your tennis career and, you know, your uh, professional and, and playing over in Europe? Yeah, I, I started kind of late to the game. I didn't start till I was really 10, 11 years old. And um, I was lucky enough for the game to, to come pretty naturally to me. And um, you know, by the time I was 16, I had won the Virginia State Championships and and I had qualified for the national championships and went on to play uh, internationally, played, spent a lot of time in Europe, um, playing all over Europe uh, professionally, and uh, played for a club in Germany as well, which was kind of a sweet deal. They pay for you to come over, they give you a car and give you an apartment, you just have to show up on Sundays and, and play a match for them, and they hand over some Deutschmarks, and then you're off to wander around Europe until you have to show up the next week. So lots of amazing experiences wandering around Europe in my BW bus and um uh you know really formative experience in many many ways i gotta admit i love the sport it's uh it's a very very fun sport it's frustrating too sometimes but uh, i really and truly loved playing it uh, and uh, i'm glad to see that uh, you had a lot of fun doing that also let's skip from sports to psychotherapy how did you make the transition from one to the other well, that's a great question. Um, you know, one of the things I learned early on in my tennis career was that the mental game was every bit as important as the physical game. And, um, you know, at one point in my career, I, I kind of had a, a fall from grace. I lost confidence. And uh, I won't go into all the details except to say that that inspired me to get really curious about the sort of the inner game. And so I you know, spent many, many years sort of studying psychology, philosophy, all sorts of different ways to think about sort of maximizing my potential as a tennis player. And, and then that led naturally into real curiosity about the human condition, human potential. And, uh, and it very naturally led me into my work as a psychotherapist, which, you know, honestly is, is a true blessing and it's an honor to sit with people and, and uh, help people unpack things so they can sort of live in their best self. Very good. Very good. You know, it's strange you talk about sports being mostly a lot, a lot of times in your head. Uh, I'm that way with golf. I, uh, I, I cannot for the life of me hit a fairway wood off of the grass. I, I cannot hit anything that's not on a tee off the fairway. And I don't know why this, I think it's just something psychological that I, I learned many, it's like, well, I did it nine times and it didn't go correctly nine times. So I'm guess I'm never going to be able to do that rather than try to work on it and overcome it. It's just one of the well, things. Then you hit one out of 30 and that's what brings you back, right? Yeah, so absolutely. I, I can get it again, right? <laughs> keep, keep going. As a former golfer myself, I can relate. Yeah, that, that was my big struggle is I could never hit a fairway, but I would always go out and pull out a long iron or something like that and and I, I get like, you know, a portion of the dis distance I could have gotten with a fairway wood, but nope, no luck, no luck. <laughs> Another song <laughs> we're going to feature is What About Now? In the notes, it says it's a portrait of someone struggling to make a hard decision about a relationship, but ultimately knowing what they have to do. Can you unpack that for us? Sure thing. I mean, this is really my uh, singer-songwriter version of the uh, the famous Clash song, Should I Stay or Should I Go Now? Oh, there you and, go. Uh, awesome. <laughs> it's kind of the same kind of thing. This is someone who really kind of knows what they need to do. And like many of my songs, I sort of set up a dilemma, a conflict, you know, often being pulled by two different parts of the personality. Maybe I should do this, maybe I should do that. And I sort of set up this conflict, but also try to create an opening, a possibility. And, you know, folks might think that a, you know, that a record about psychotherapy written through the lens of the first person voice of the client. And I want to say right off the bat here that none of my stories about uh, that are written from the voice of the client are real, real clients. These are fictional studies and portraits of people, but based on universal themes of therapy and things that have happened, um, you know, generally speaking in my practice. So uh, you know, a lot of people will think about this record and say, gee, this sounds like a cheery little record about therapy. And in fact, you know, many folks, when they listen to it carefully, actually discovered that, that it's actually a pretty positive record. There's a lot of possibilities that are unfolding for people. But at the same time, I really try not to make this a kumbaya, saccharine experience, of, uh, but to make it real and honest. That these, are, these are some real struggles that people have, but hopefully there's always a resolution in the song, and hopefully that comes forward in the song as well. All right, very good. Let's play that right now. What about now from M. Bray right now on the Someone You Should Know podcast? I'm well beyond no, yet here I am. It's 
stuck on the edge of begin again I expand, contract, turn away then back Pace around, yes, between two tracks I've been tacking in the wind Thinking about who I've been, who I am Separate from yours, claim what's mine Something emerging on the cusp I'm moving in and out of trust, out of trust About now, that's also from the album Second Skin from um, M. Brady. I have to ask you, with all the things that you do, being a musician and being a psychotherapist, how do you how do you balance the roles? Well, it's a good question. Um, luckily, I'm I'm super inspired by my work, um, and because I'm now writing songs pretty exclusively about um, character studies of fictional clients, there's they sort of meld together really in a, in a natural way. And um, I actually find the process much easier. I used to, you know, I've written songs for many years and they're traditional kind of confessional songs. And they're frankly a lot more difficult for me to write than these songs because I'm really able to just step into character uh, like an actor. I step into character and, and so writing comes a lot easier. And um, so, you know, uh, they, they sort of merge together, honestly. Awesome. Very good. Very good. I like that you get inspired by your work and such. A lot of people just, you know, they slag away at a 40 hour a week job or just, you know, get nothing out of it. You're not only helping people, but you're also inspiring your, your own creative juices to go too. So that's, that's amazing. I love things like that. Uh, I, I want to ask you as far as your future goals for your music projects and also your psychotherapy practice. Yeah. I mean, in terms of my practice, I'm in private practice in Western Massachusetts. And, you know, I can expect to continue that, honestly, until the day I drop. I, you know, I often feel like I'm my best self in, in therapy. And, I'm, and there's no reason for me to think about, you know, I'm going to retire and hit the golf course just because uh, the work is is really meaningful. So I, I expect I'll work, you know, I assume at a reduced capacity when I'm older. But um, so I, I can expect that to continue in terms of my musical life, you know, in some ways I just feel like I'm getting started. Really. I, I came to music late in terms of being serious about it. I had to overcome some, a doubting voice in my mind that my, my songs were too, this or too that, too vulnerable to whatever. And, you know, comparing myself to all those kind of things that took me, I sort of you know, sat in my songs for a long time. And, and I'm grateful to sort of say that this project has truly been transformational. That, that word sometimes gets overused but for me it really was and i really sort of found my voice as a musician 
and as a songwriter and uh, almost developed an ultimate personality than what I had before for many years. And so I'm really looking forward to sort of building on that and seeing what's next, both as a songwriter and, and uh, hopefully, you know, playing live, which I've been, you know, frankly, a little bit trepidous about, but uh, I hope to step into that. So let's talk about some of your sh- social media as far as where can people find more information about your music? Sure thing. My music website is mbradymusic.com. And there you'll find, uh, obviously, the music links to the record on uh, several streaming platforms. Also, a link to Bandcamp. If you don't, if you don't subscribe to any streaming platforms, you can listen to music for free on Bandcamp. Um, also, you'll find there the videos that I referenced. Um, and there's also an essay I wrote that was published in the Journal of Expressive Writing back in March of 2024, which sort of chronicles my experience of of making this record and kind of what happens. And really one of the reasons I'm even doing this podcast is that I, I really think um, I learned a lot from what what I sort of overcame. And I think it might help other folks that, that are maybe struggling with confidence or, you know, what's called imposter syndrome in psychology or anxiety, performance anxiety, whatever that might be. Um, and so one of the reasons I'm doing this is really kind of as a, as a public service of sorts. Obviously, I'd love people to listen to the record. I'm really proud of it. And um, hopefully people can learn some things as well. And there's an essay I wrote that, uh, that you'll find there. Awesome. Very good. We'll link to that and make sure everyone checks it out. Now, the next feature is uh, something that I love to do. It's called Tales from the Road. Those are those infamous road stories where things didn't go quite as planned. Now, since you have not really been on the road, uh, let's talk about Tales from the Studio. <laughs> Any, yeah. Anything um, interesting happened while you were doing your recordings? Oh, you mean just besides deleting the perfect track that I hadn't spent hours recording? Oh, and, let's and talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, I, I have to admit, I can be a little bit obsessive about um, recording and wanting to, wanting to find the perfect track and sing it you know, just the way I want to feel it and you know, all that. And and so there's been several occasions where, uh, Lord, I still to this day don't know why I'm a bit of a technophobe coming to uh, modern technology late, um, where I had spent hours and hours and hours on on this vocal rendition of a song. And uh, it was exactly where I wanted it. And I woke up the next morning sort of eager to listen to what happened to see if it sounded as good as I thought it would. It did the night before, and it was nowhere to be found. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> I've unfortunately had a few a few of those tales, but uh, it's been quite a learning curve. But it's one of the reasons I'm really excited about the next album because I feel like I have a lot more command of my home studio and, uh, and a lot more confidence. I'm really looking forward to what isn't comes it, next. Isn't it amazing what you can do in a home studio nowadays? It just floors me. Yeah, it really is. I mean, to have a fully orchestrated record, um, you know, part of it is is uh, you know using um, instruments off of off of the computer. Some of it is um, people sending me files from New York city. My brother sent me keyboard tracks and, and somebody else sent me some live drums from, from Atlanta. So it's just amazing uh, what you can create at home these days and have it sound, you know, pretty decent. It, it floors me how what, what we can do nowadays with technology. I had an interesting uh, interview or uh, planned. I was talking to about scheduling an interview and the individual said, I, I don't get it to Chicago very often. I said, no, we do this all via zoom. He goes, you do it via zoom. And I said, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's like, you know, getting a chance to see one another over the, over the, the, um, the video and get a chance to talk to one another. And the audio quality is really good via Zoom. So I'm very, very happy about that. And uh, it was, it's wonderful to be able to do something like this. I mean, I've had uh, listeners all around the world uh, or guests all around the world. And uh, it just seems like they're sitting right next to me. It's, I just really love the, the way things are able to help nowadays with the technology. Tell you what, we're going to wrap up the show with uh, one more song. It's called Rise. What is the story on Rise? Well, this is kind of an unusual song in that it's really a, 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 the protagonist is really speaking to himself, honestly. And this this tracks the story of someone who's struggling and looks to spirituality to try to create a greater sense of peace. And mm-hmm. uh, the protagonist gets involved in a couple of different spiritual pursuits. And while it was helpful to them, uh, to quote Bono from U2, uh, they still didn't find what they were looking oh, for, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Anyway, they made this decision that they needed to sort of take a deeper dive into their own personal history, and maybe they had un- underweighted some things that happened to them. And this is sort of the story of someone uh, going on that quest and what they discover along the way. Very good. Michael, I thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy practice to be with us today and discuss your, your musical career, your psychotherapy practice, and, and you. I really do appreciate you taking the time Honestly. to be with us. I really appreciate it. It's been an honor to be here, and thanks for everything you do for for artists like myself. I prayed in Rome. 
I sat in the pall, tried to dissolve, become nothing at all. Learned how to fade, I learned how to fall. Found something there, but didn't find it all. I was waiting in between. I had slowed to a crawl, and then I turned, and you were there. I've been within, I've been without, I've been wild, I've been devout, I've been lost, thought I was found, now I hear a sound. Hi, this is Rick Anthony thanking you again for listening to this episode of Someone You Should Know. Now, if you're an aspiring musician or an established musician that's looking for a little exposure, I invite you to drop us a line at someone you should know podcast at gmail.com. That's someone you should know podcast at gmail.com. Also, I invite you to tell a friend about the Someone You Should Know podcast. I thank you for tuning in this time and I invite you to check us out next time on the Someone You Should Know podcast, because you never know who's going to show up. Until next time, remember, God loves you, and so do I.